we're interested in housing issues in the city. We want to talk about, uh, understand what the challenges are facing Vancouver, and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, what perspective you have on the housing debate and what's brought you to an understanding of housing in the city. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, I'm, I'm an urban planner, and, and my interest really is the project of the city and, and how we make more sustainable, more complete, more viable cities. Um, and housing is a key component in that. I think Vancouver does face some serious housing challenges, but having said that, I think we've made a very good start at addressing some of those, particularly in the downtown peninsula. But that, frankly, was the easy part because we had essentially brownfield industrial sites there with a limited number of immediate neighbors to um, perhaps resist or mm -hmm. uh, complain about uh, increasing densification. Mm -hmm. But I think the real challenge that Vancouver is facing is the remaining suburban land base within the city of Vancouver, and I'm talking about the city specifically now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let alone beyond the city's boundaries, although there are even bigger problems regionally. Um, so, um, so I think it's the 60 to 70 percent of the, of the zoned land base in the remaining part of the city where we have just begun to really grapple with the issue of housing choice affordability is a big issue with the decline of the limited land base, um, the increasing uh, expense or cost of housing, um, and the real concern, I think, that Vancouver is moving along a trajectory that's going to make it harder and harder for a diverse range of demographics of people to be able to actually afford to live in the city. I think that's a huge issue that's confronting the city. Well, um, we don't necessarily just do specifically housing, although I have worked on housing projects from uh, design guidelines and built form guidelines uh, for local areas and neighborhoods. Uh, we just did a a piece of work, for example, in the Mount Pleasant business improvement area where we looked at build form guidelines for mixed use, including housing, and how housing was an important component of, of developing a more viable node, if you like. Um, but in the past, I've also worked on some large rezonings for a major densification housing projects, uh, uh, for example, the Bayshore Gardens project down on uh, Georgia Street around the Western Bayshore Hotel. Um, but my interest really is in housing as part of the mix of a successful, vibrant, sustainable city. Well, what I said was it doesn't provide the range of solutions. I think it's part of the solution, but it's unbalanced. And with the declining or limited land base and with the increase in land value, I don't think it's sustainable for Vancouver at the center of the metro metropolitan region to continue to provide exclusively single-family housing to that extent. But I do think single-family housing has to remain as part of the mix. But I think the solution is a whole range of other housing types that build upon single-family housing without radically changing the look and the feel of what is essentially a suburban residential neighborhood, and we all like those. But I think there's lots of housing types, uh, and we can point to certain models of those around the world, and in Vancouver to some limited extent, that I would like to see um, become much more prevalent within the mix of housing in order to build a more sustainable um, community. Uh, I'm thinking of you know, the obvious things like secondary suites being legalized at some point. That's a relatively easy one to, to talk about because the building doesn't change at all. But also permitting far more, and perhaps everywhere, uh, the idea of a, of a second detached unit on the property. In other words, a duplex or a secondary suite somewhere on the property, whether that's a, a lane-oriented carriage house or granny suite or over the garage or a duplex or a zero lot courtyard housing types. Um, there are many different types, um, vertically stacked, horizontally stacked, side by side. Uh, there are also examples, very few in Vancouver, where the front yard has been filled in, essentially that the housing unit comes right out almost to the property line. And you know there are one or two examples of that. Uh, the key one that's missing in Vancouver is what I would call traditional row housing. Uh, which is somewhat like some of the new town housing we're seeing in the downtown projects in downtown south and elsewhere in Vancouver. Um, but I'm talking about freehold that share a party wall with a neighbor on one or even both sides. So it's either semi-detached or fully uh, attached. Um, you see a lot more of that type of a housing product in the older 19th and early 20th century uh, suburbs of cities like Toronto and Montreal and Boston and New York. We have very, very little of that housing type in Vancouver. It's an extremely efficient housing type. It's uh, very land. In, it's, it's very efficient in terms of using the land base, uh, and it also creates um, opportunities for more uh, modest, smaller housing types that will uh, be affordable for and appeal to different types of people, whether that's seniors who don't have kids anymore in the house, or empty nesters, or 
uh, single parents or um, students, uh, etc., etc. Um, my concern is that the housing, the single family house, is not a very adaptable housing type. And, and we need to look at some more adaptable housing types. And in order to do that in the city, I think the challenge for the city is to take a very serious look at the zoning restrictions that have pertained for many, many years in the city in the single-family neighborhoods. Well, I'm not suggesting row housing everywhere. I think that it needs to be strategically applied. All of these types of housing, these housing types need to be applied on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood basis with the involvement of the community, clearly, who have a stake in the community. But I think the, the real challenge, and, and it's, a, it's a nut that I'm not sure any of us has cracked yet, is how to disconnect the idea of densification, incremental densification, through careful infill housing of this type, from the notion that that reduces the livability and the, the value of the neighborhood. Um, the problem is that densification has a bad rap historically because most people think of densification as great big high-rise towers that get plunked in from their neighborhoods. And unfortunately, we've had a few of those historically in Vancouver. Um, I think we know better now that we can achieve higher densification in a much more modest incremental forms of infill without detracting from the look and feel of a single-family neighborhood. I've given you some examples of the housing types. Uh, the infill, the duplex, the rear yard uh, unit, the garage suite or the granny suite, uh, etc., etc. Um, I think the the I think it would be very interesting to do some pilot studies with communities and neighbourhoods that are receptive to doing that. And I believe there are some in Vancouver if we ask the right questions and we explain it properly and thoroughly uh, to see just how much of this type of housing could actually be fitted in to the existing neighbourhoods. I think we might be pleasantly surprised. We might be quite surprised as just how much we could achieve, both in terms of diversity of housing types and increasing affordability and just overall volume and quantity of housing um, if we went through that route rather than major rezonings. I'm not talking about throwing out single-family rezoning, and I think that would be quite inappropriate, and if, I was, if it was my neighborhood, I too would be protesting against that. I'm talking about this kind of incremental changes by permitting a whole range of housing types and tenureships, you know, from rental through strata title through freehold, etc., um, that would come into various neighborhoods and look differently in different neighborhoods. Um, the, the zoning regulations are very restrictive currently as they stand today in terms of achieving some of those. But I should also hasten to add, Tom, that it's not just the zoning, it's not just the city that's in control of that, but you know the, the lenders, the people that finance this, and the development community itself also need to take some leadership in that. There are some issues around building code, there are issues around financing and what the bankers will lend on, the type of product that they're familiar with, that they think will sell, that they, they perceive as being you know, uh, reasonably ro low risk. Uh, certainly the building code has issues around that. Um, so I think it's more than just the city. I think it really involves a collective look at the kinds of tools and mechanisms that we have put in place over the years quite legitimately uh, to protect from the abuses of you know, real problems. But it may be you know, that we're at the point of maturing as a city and needing to move forward, we need to rethink some of those tools. Well, I think there are there are lots of opportunities for green space, you know, from the scale of the little pocket yard, that, or even just a balcony or a roof deck or a terrace um, that a that a unit can have, all the way up to collective green space, you know, public green space that is shared by people in the immediate neighbourhood, from local neighbourhood pocket parks all the way through to very much larger parks. And one of the things I've always um, argued. Um, as a, one of the tenets of good, solid urban planning, and I didn't make this up, but you know, I studied this, is that you put your maximum density nearest the maximum public amenity. And what that really means in simple English is that um, where you have a large public green space, that's where you should actually concentrate increased density because they can then take advantage of that green space. If you like, they kind of borrow that back their green space is, is the public green space. And a good example of that, I think, in Vancouver, one of the few good examples that I can think of right now, is the recent redevelopment of the Arbutus industrial lands around uh, the park in Kitsilano, around Kitsilano Community Centre, where you have you know, a significant up-densification around that park space. So the park actually is being optimised and that the people have essentially exchanged the idea of having their own private little backyard 
in their single family house for um, a higher amenity of access to an immediately adjacent public park space with all of those facilities and access to the community center. So I think, the, again, the solution in terms of uh, green space in the city is, yes, there's no question that as a city densifies, it becomes more challenging for each individual property owner or homeowner to have their own private green space. But I think we can reduce our expectations about how big those are and build those into denser projects, whether, as I say, decks or terraces or front porches or roof decks and so on. But more importantly, offset the loss in private green space with increased amenity and access to public green space. Uh, good examples as well in the downtown peninsula is the entire redevelopment of the urban waterfront walkway system, whereby people have exchanged a single family house in Carisdale or Shaughnessy or wherever for uh, an apartment in a high rise complex with immediate direct access to the waterfront, which is a shared public green space. Um, I think a lot of people, when offered those choices, will actually choose to do the latter rather than maintain the, the former. The issue around, around private green space for a lot of people, certainly for me, is that it should be usable. It should be practical, functional, use, usable green space, as opposed to just passive green space that separates me from my neighbors or provides me with a whole lot of privacy. I think when push comes to shove, a lot of people will say, what I really want to be able to do is have a little you know, herb garden or be able to sit on my deck and read a book in the sun or whatever it is that they do, you know, a patch of dirt to work on. But they don't need yards and yards of green sward. I think most people, frankly, will use the green space in fairly limited ways. Obviously, when we have kids, you know, there's a need for larger green space, and that's where I think the local neighborhood park and the pocket park really come in. You know, and Vancouver is quite blessed in that regard. If you look at a map of the city of Vancouver, we have this very broad sort of um, network of these little local neighborhood parks, which is just half a block or even a block in some cases that have been left undeveloped over the years. And they're pretty broadly spread out across the city. And I think those are really significant assets at the neighborhood level. And then in addition to that, of course, we have the larger, you know, significantly metropolitan parks, you know, all the way up to Stanley Park. Um, but I think we're going to have to somehow, all of us, get our heads around the idea that we don't, as of a right, all have the right to a private green space forever and ever. There, yeah, there are several in my neighborhood, when I walk and drive around Kitsilano, um, of, of duplex infills where you have a front and a rear unit or you have a side-by-side -side unit. Uh, certainly uh, north of Thorpe, there are several of those. Um, there are a couple of examples that I'm aware of in Vancouver of rear yard work studios. There are very few, mm -hmm. very tough to get through the current uh, building bylaw and, mm -hmm. and zoning bylaws, um, where you have a studio in the rear instead of a garage or uh, over the garage. Can, can you suggest um, one where we yeah, can do Yeah, I think there's one at, um, thinking now, is it 13th and Dunbar or 13th and Collingwood? Um, there is um, a couple of examples where the front yard has been built out uh, on a, a little yeah, where are those? Where are project. you thinking There's of there? At, um, I think it's Blenheim and 7th. I can look up the address for you. There's also, uh, yeah, that would be on, on Blenheim or on 7th? It's actually there. on the corner. I think it faces 7th or 8th. Um, there are also um, increasing numbers of garage units where you actually have a unit built over the garage. Uh, there's some of those in Mount Pleasant. Again, there are some in Kitsilano where you have a secondary unit that's actually accessed off the lane. Uh, I can think of an example just of Cornwall in Kitsilano around um, Trafalgar, um, <coughs> where you have a secondary unit accessed directly off the side street or the lane. Uh, and the other one which I mentioned earlier is the idea of row housing, kind of taking a serious look at row housing, where you have a series of front doors accessed directly off the street. There's very little of that uh, in suburban Vancouver. The one example which I can think of is that Arbutus and 8th. I think it's 8th Avenue just off Arbutus Street, done by Mosaic Developments, the name of the company is Mosaic, um, where you have the narrow traditional narrow lot um, row house, side by side by side, sharing a party wall. There's a new row house going up on uh, Canby Street, uh, yes. 41st. Yes, uh, I think that's uh, also by Mosaic, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. same developer. Uh, there's an earlier example of that, and for a while it was the only one I could think of, and that is down at McDonald and First, on the east side of McDonald, around First Avenue. Mm -hmm. that, or maybe even all right to the corner, McDonald and Cornwall, just down. That's a row right house. There. Yeah, that you just uh, one little project there hmm. on the east side of McDonald. If you drive up towards Cornwall hmm. to the waterfront. Okay. Then the other one, and and we have I think done this quite well. Is I think the C2 zone. This is what the city of Vancouver calls C2 zoning, which is typically three levels of housing uh, over one level of um, of stores of retail.
along the major arterial roads, the, which are traditionally the streetcar routes or the trolleybus routes on West 4th and on Broadway and so on. The Capers Block, as it's called colloquially, mm -hmm. uh, is a classic example of that. Uh, the Trafalgar's, Trafalgar Building uh, at Trafalgar and Broadway is another good example. Uh, I think those are very important um, uh, exemplars of the kinds of densification that I'm talking about that uh, don't involve you know, massive big buildings, you know, more than three or four stories, and yet achieve a level of livability <coughs> and amenity and very intimate access to services and transportation, which is, of course, key to the mix of a livable city. But I always, you know, when people come to town, I always just walk around or drive them around Kitsilano because actually Kitsilano, as in what I would describe as an inner city suburb, has some interesting examples, a few and far between around the city, but Kitsilano seems to have quite a few of those. Hmm. If you kind of just poke around, you can actually see a lot of these housing types hmm. um, emerging fitfully, unfortunately, but emerging uh, in the neighborhood. And yet, I think most people would say, uh, I think it's fair to say, that Kitsilano still feels and looks like essentially a single-family neighborhood. It still feels like a suburban neighborhood as opposed to a, an urban downtown neighborhood. No one would mistake it for Yale Town. Or, you know, a lot of, I know, I have friends who live around the Sassamac Gardens project, and they all started with that same position. Oh, this is going to be terrible. This is going to negatively impact my land values. This is going to bring the wrong type of person into my community, those types of things. But when you actually had a, a friendly engagement, a friendly debate about that with them, with, these are my friends, and pointed out, for example, that they themselves might one day want to be able to stay in their neighborhood without living in a large single-family house and all the costs attached to maintaining and upkeeping that, or maybe their kids would like to come back and move into the neighborhood as young students at UBC, um, then they began to think, hmm, maybe there is a point here that needs to be thought about. And we can't just simply use single-family housing over you know, the long term sustainably uh, if we want a more complete, diverse mm -hmm. demographic mm -hmm. community. And I think that's really the key here. Is what I'm after isn't densification for the sake of densification, but because I think um, densification is a key component in creating a more sustainable, more livable, uh, more diverse, more complete community, urban community.